Welcome to St John Sutherland. I'm Rhys and I'll be leading you through the service this morning. Uh, Tom is starting a new uh, sermon series on the book of Joshua, so we uh, look forward to hearing from him a bit later on. I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you to honour you, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, who was, who is with the Father and Son, is worshipped and glorified. Calm our hearts and minds that we may learn from you and be salt and light in the world. I've got an acknowledgement of countryside. I, I know I keep on um, putting these up, but uh, actually, I, I do think it's important because it was a little story. Um, I went to the dawn service at Anzac Day in Sutherland, and it was it, it's good. Yeah, we're, we're we're trying. You've got your Australian flag, your New Zealand flag, and your Aboriginal flag. Great. Aboriginal flag was upside down. <laughs> Hardly anybody noticed. So it's, it's that sort of that, 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 that you know, we, we, we see what's going on and the terrible things that are going on in, in Ukraine. Um, cast back 200 something years, you know, it must have felt like that to them with what we were doing. So um, with that said, uh, let's uh, read. I'll, I'll read to you. As we gather in the presence of God, we acknowledge the Darawal speaking people, traditional custodians of these lands and waters, and pay respects to elders, present and future. We celebrate the rich contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to our church and society. Okay, now, there is some, um, so yeah, so just uh, th think about that and if, if you give yourself the chance to express um, or give the Aboriginal people a chance to express what's important to them, and, uh, and, and look for the things in their cultures which is compatible um, with, um, uh, with, with our faith and to affirm our faith in the one true God. There is indeed one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We know this because he's shown us, both with what we call special revelation, so that's the, the words uh, and which are, are special only to the people who have, have seen and heard the words, um, but also general revelation, um, the, uh, providing the universe for us to marvel at, where the evidence of God is generally there for everyone to observe. And we're going to use both of these sorts of revelation, uh, special and general, as we stand to sing our first song, which is At Your Name. We see the nations. Okay. So this week we're going to be singing along to Battle Tracks. Um, so it's a, a new experience for us, a new experience for you, but remember we are called to make a joyful noise to the Lord. It doesn't have to be note perfect, so if we fluff it up, um, just stay joyful. <laughs> Please stand.
Please be seated. Great job. Great job, everyone. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready. Well, that's from Joshua, chapter 1, verse 2. Today's reading, the first in the series, starts at chapter 13. So, to hear and maybe read the rest of this fascinating book, come back at 3pm and read the whole of the book with Cam Bailey and Dan Glynn. Uh, yes, so now for today's Bible readings, and then Tom will open God's Word to us. Thanks, Margaret. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 16. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they are, have been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Here ends this reading. Our next Bible reading is Joshua chapter 13, verses 1 to 14. When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, You are now very old, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. This is the land that remains, all the regions of the Philistines and the Jesurites, from the Shehor River on the east of Egypt to the territory of Ekron on the north. All of it is counted as Canaanite, though held by the five Philistine rulers in Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath and Ekron. The territory of the Avites on the south, all the land of the Canaanites from Ara of the Sidians as far as Aphek and the borders of the Amorites. The area of the Byblos and all Lebanon to the east, from Baal Gad, below Mount Hermon to Lebo Hamath. As for the inhabitants of the mountain regions from Lebanon to Mizrafoth, Maine, that is, all of Sidonians, I myself will drive them out before the Israelites. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have instructed you, and divide it as inheritance among the nine tribes and half of the tribe of Manus A. <laughs> the other half of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites, had received the inheritance that Moses had given them east of the Jordan, as he, the servant of the Lord, had assigned it to them. It extended from Arrow, Arrow, uh, sorry, on the rim of Arnon Gorge and from the town of the middle of the gorge, and included the whole plateau of Medeba as far as Dibon and all the towns of Shihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Hezbon, out of the border of the Ammonites. It also included Gilead, the, ter the territory of the people of Gezur and Makkah, 
all of the Mount, Herm, Mount Hermon and all Bashan, as far as Salika, that is, the whole kingdom of Og in Bashan, who had reigned in Ashtaroth and Edre. He was the last of the Raphonites. Moses had defeated them and taken over the land. But the Israelites did not drive out the people of Geshur and Maka, so they continue to live among the Israelites to this day. But to the tribe of Levi he gave no inheritance, since the food offerings presented to the Lord, the God of Israel, are their inheritance as he promised them. Three cheers for Kylie. Well done. <laughs> Um, we're going to be reading Joshua together and that, I hope that whet your appetite for the reading time this afternoon. Uh, you can come along at three and join in uh, as we read the whole book and you know it's a funny thing to do isn't it to, to think oh let's uh, read through the whole book but one of the things that that does is give you this quite incredible uh, oversight of the whole book in one go and it's quite a different perspective um, than just coming to the small chunks of uh, the passages as we do in church. So I would encourage you to uh, come along and be part of that if you've got the time this afternoon. Um, it reminded me, as Kylie read, I had a conversation with a friend uh, who is a, a gentleman uh, older than me and well thought through. And um, he said to me, you know, the thing about the Bible is it's so transparently fiction. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, oh, you know, you open those um, old parts of the Bible and read about all those places and, and made up names and I said mate it's all still there you can visit them and he said what do you mean and he, he's a very very clever well thought through man and did not realise that we're reading uh, history and geography that these are the places that exist today not all of them admittedly are known uh, in terms of their location but certainly most of the places that Kylie just read uh, are places that we know and in fact have archaeology from and so uh, I hope this morning as we come to the book of Joshua it fills you actually with a sense of great confidence in the word of God that these are um, actually evidences of the Bible's trustworthiness and we're going to be reading together in the next few weeks moments in Israel's history that should uh, hopefully God willing speak to us about our relationship with God and the certainty of his promises to us and his faithfulness. And so this series has been called The God of All Faithfulness because that's really what we're going to be looking at over the, the next few weeks. And today we're joining um, Joshua's Israel in looking ahead to what remains. Uh, that is the future uh, land that remained uh, for them to be allotted. So let's pray as we come to God's word together. Our loving Father, we do praise you as the psalmist calls us to shout for joy and worship you with gladness because we are your people, the sheep of your pasture, and because you are good and your love endures forever, your faithfulness to all generations. So, Father, as we return to the book of Joshua today, teach us again of your faithfulness and reliability and of your ability to keep your promises and the blessing that this is to all who trust you. Amen. Well, this year is the 90th anniversary of the opening of the Harbour Bridge. And I don't know about you, but I've actually really enjoyed this um, because my Facebook feed keeps feeding me photos of the construction of the Harbour Bridge. And they're amazing photos. You know, some of my favourite photos are of the men, the workmen on the bridge, who seemingly are unaware of the kilometre below them as they stride across the beams um, that they're laying out on the, on the big gap. Um, quite incredible era of Australian history. And, you know, it got me thinking what it must have been like as they went through the planning stages for this bridge, what it must have been like for those engineers to stand on, on either side and look across the, uh, the, the harbour and think, oh, yeah, we'll just pop, put a bridge in. I mean, what would you have thought? I would have gone home. I would have given up. Um, but they had great confidence... Because, of course, um, they could see what lay before them. They had the plans and they were confident that what they could look to in the future, this plan, was actually going to take shape and become reality and it was going to change Sydney and Australia forever. 
Um, I don't know whether you've heard the story about the young boy um, who decided that he had to be at the opening of the Harbour Bridge. I think this is a story that demonstrates just how significant this was in Australia those years ago. As a little boy of, I think, seven, he hopped on the back of his little horse and decided to ride from Melbourne by himself through the bush to come to Sydney to be part of the opening ceremony of the Harbour Bridge. Um, people wanted to be part of this incredible moment and there was this rather amazing uh, looking forward, looking to the future of what this bridge would mean. Though it was a massive undertaking and a massive project, people believed it would come to pass. And today what we're looking at as we open the, the uh, book of Joshua again is quite a fundamental moment in the history of Israel. They're looking ahead to a future that hasn't yet arrived but they had reason to be confident that it would happen. That is, that they would inherit the promised land of Canaan. Uh, a bit of a recap on the chapters that have come before. Uh, we're starting at chapter 13. We've looked at chapters 1 to 12 um, some time ago. And the book of Joshua falls into four very neat little packages. Um, and I'd really recommend, if you've got uh, the time during the week, have a look online for the Bible Project's video on the overview of Joshua. It's only about seven minutes long. But gee, it's a helpful look at how the book fits together. And uh, it really captures these four moments. In chapters 1 to 5, we have the big moment of handover of leadership. Joshua becomes the leader of Israel after the death of Moses. And then in chapters 6 to 12, we have uh, the first battles as Israel move into places like Jericho and actually begin to subdue the land, to take over the land of Canaan. And then section 3 begins at chapter 13 where we begin today and uh, we see God's call to continue to the work of taking the land and the fourth section is the very little chap uh, and the little section at the end of the book chapters 23 and 24 Joshua's final words to Israel before he dies so the book of Joshua takes us through the whole lifespan of Joshua as leader of Israel and takes us through the period of God bringing Israel from being nomadic to being a settled nation in a country. It's actually a remarkable change in uh, Israel's history, in world history. And in chapter 11, we hear at the end of chapter 11 that um, Israel knew peace from war. Chapter 12 takes us through a long list of 31 kingdoms that they conquered to settle in the promised land. And so you might be thinking, well, what's left to say in chapters 13 to 24? Well, we'll find out in a moment. I want to suggest to you, though, that Joshua is a very problematic book for us to read, and particularly in our context today, as we see such sad events happening in our world, and as we're actually witnessing one nation, Russia, aggressively uh, impose on Ukraine, uh, seeking to take back that land to be their own, raises an alarming question for us as believers in uh, the Bible. Uh, was God really interested, really supportive in encouraging Israel to attack and remove these peoples from the land of Canaan uh, via warfare? You can see why this is a problematic book. Uh, this is a fundamental question that we need to answer uh, for ourselves and for our friends about the Bible. Because in fact, as we read on, we'll see that, yes, God is very clearly encouraging Joshua and Israel to undertake these military exercises and to take this land off the existing people. So how on earth do we understand this? It's a very important question. Uh, obviously, this morning, we don't have time to go into the... Uh, amount of detail that would probably be helpful in answering that question. Uh, but I do want to make three statements and then a recommendation. The first uh, statement is that we follow a God who is love. So how do we understand how the God of love could ever mandate warfare? Well, if you've got a romanticised version of God in your mind, that is that God is only love, then 
we need to just readjust our picture of who God is from the point of view of the Bible because the Bible reminds us that our God is also the God of holiness and we need to be very mind uh, we need to be very clear in our minds who God is uh, because he is the God of love but is also the God of holiness who is described as a consuming fire in the book of Hebrews Hebrews 12:29 and he's the God who in his holiness will not tolerate human sin Jesus warns us that God himself will bring justice on sin through a future judgment and this is who our God is. He is the God of holiness and love but he is the God of salvation and judgment as well. Uh, And this helps us understand what we see in the book of Joshua as Joshua and Israel bring a judgment from the holy God against an unholy set of people in uh, the the land of Canaan. Second statement is we see God's love and holiness work most closely together at the cross of Jesus. So as Christians, we have a unique ability to, to grasp the difficulty of God's love and holiness and how they work hand in hand. And this is really fundamental to our faith, isn't it? Um, because at the cross, we see God's incredible love for the world in giving his own innocent son as a substitute for those who are under his judgment. But we see God pour out his holy judgment on his innocent son uh, as a real payment for sin. So in his love, God does not ignore his holiness, but at the cross we see God's love and holiness working hand in hand. This is fundamental to what we believe about our God. He is the God of love and of holiness and therefore the cross of Christ helps us understand what we see in the whole of scripture that God does act in love and in judgment it is who he is and it's true to himself in God's judgment thirdly we see God's love at work he is the God who desires not only to um, save his world but he is the God who desires to teach us his ways and his punishment steers us towards holiness which is good for us. So despite the fact that we feel very uncomfortable about seeing God judge in history, um, we have to admit it actually does teach us about the character of God and encourages us to become obedient to his ways. Lastly, justice belongs to our God and not to us. And isn't this important? Justice is the Lord's and we hear him instructing us very clearly what that means for our personal choices god says you shall not murder exodus 20 13 10 commandments and jesus says love your neighbor as yourself matthew 22 39 we can therefore confidently affirm that judgment belongs to the lord and what occurs in joshua is god's judgment and is not general permission for warfare We may also affirm that what happens in Joshua is not the same as what is happening in Ukraine or any other war-torn country in our world. And if you'd like to do more thinking about this difficult topic, then I do recommend to you Melvin Tinker's short book, Mass Destruction, Is God Guilty of Genocide? It's available online at Coorong. Um, I I will put that in the bulletin next week because you're never going to remember that, are you? but a a very small book that really helps us deal with this difficult issue in more detail. Um, Mass Destruction is God Guilty of Genocide, Melvin Tinker. All right, so uh, let's take a bit of a a deeper dive into what we've read so far this morning. Firstly, seeing what God is calling Israel to do, like uh, the engineers on the the harbour looking at this massive project that they need to do, uh, but with trust that they can complete the bridge So Joshua is now in the promised land and God gives him a very clear mandate in verses uh, 13, 1 to 6 or 1 to 5. When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, you are now very old and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. Here is the land that remains. And Kylie did a brilliant job of reading all those place names, which I'm not going to try and read. I got you to do the hard bit there, Kylie. Um, And uh, he says further down in verse 6, I myself will drive all these people out before the Israelites. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance 
as I have instructed you, and divide it as an inheritance among the nine and a half tribes, uh, nine tribes and half of the tribe of Manasseh. So this is actually a little bit surprising because we've just remembered that in chapters 1 to 12, we got to the point where we heard Israel took the land and they had peace from war. And now suddenly we get to chapter 13 and God is saying, uh, Joshua, you need to complete this work. And suddenly we're given a new insight into what we've read so far, which is Israel have kind of essentially taken control of the promised land but they actually haven't finished the work at all. In fact, uh, even though they have undergone uh, three separate military uh, campaigns by this stage, north, middle and south, to take different parts of Israel, the nine and a half tribes who are to settle on the west side of the Jordan River haven't actually had their land allotted to them yet. So there's actually a great deal more to do Till God's promises have been fulfilled about Israel's inheritance. Joshua is called at a very old age now, 45 years on from coming into the promised land, to complete the work. That's interesting, isn't it, to discover this surprise. There is much to be done. Importantly, God guarantees uh, the success and guarantees Israel's inheritance. And this is our second point. Uh, God guarantees this work in verses 6 to 7 of chapter 13. God says to Joshua, I myself will drive them out before the Israelites. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance as I have instructed you and divide it as an inheritance among the nine and a half tribes. Notice that God is urging Joshua to complete what God himself has initiated and begun. He wants uh, all the villages, towns and cities captured and he wants all of it allocated to the remaining nine and a half tribes of Israel. God's guarantee is that the military success of Israel will not depend on their ability in war but instead will be successful because of God himself bringing about their success. He will drive out the nations currently living there. This is a very good thing because Joshua himself might not be that effective on the battlefield at 85. So God is encouraging Joshua to go forward with this plan confidently, despite what we may say the evidence might suggest. Yes, he's 85, but God is going to bring this about. So future victories in battle are guaranteed and the land as an inheritance for these tribes is also guaranteed. But they do require Joshua and Israel to act and to trust God. Well, the areas that Joshua needs to secure is still large. How do we apply this uh, to ourselves living more than 3,000 years on? Um, because certainly it's easy to understand how this applied to Israel at the time, isn't it? They had to get on with it. Um, but what does this actually mean for us? And today, um, I think this is a, a really great opportunity for us to think about a larger issue, which is how do we, as, as Christians living in Sutherland, Australia, 2022, how do we read the Old Testament and apply it to ourselves in what is a very, very, very different era and time of history. How do we understand the, these parts of the Old Testament and what they say to us? Well, I want to use that bridge analogy again uh, because it's a very big gap in history that we're seeking to bridge uh, to understand how God's word speaks to us today. But you might remember we read Hebrews um, earlier today and that gives us a really clear pathway for crossing that bridge. Uh, so you might not have noticed at the time, but Graham, I might ask if we can bring that uh, Hebrews passage up again. Um, did you notice um, what they're looking forward to, what type of city they're looking forward to in verse 10? And a little hint, we should go to the next slide. Um, what is, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was the first slide, sorry. What was the city they were longing for? Did anyone notice? I 
should have a verse reference for you. Yeah, and I think it must be a third slide where he goes on to say, sorry for those at home watching this, this is a bit, bit klutzy of me. Is there a third slide, Graham? Ah, that would answer it. So you can see that the country that they're longing for, uh, down in verse 15, if they'd been thinking of the country they'd left, they would have had recourse uh, to go back, opportunity re to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one, the author of Hebrews says. Now, this is really interesting. Sorry, that was a long way to get there. Um, but uh, this is really interesting because it's not what you'd expect because, in fact, they'd left a land to go to the promised land. So you would say, what were they looking forward to? They're looking forward to the promised land, which is true. The author of Hebrews said, well, there was a greater significance than that, though. Um, they're actually longing for something more than a geographic place on planet Earth. They were longing for something that would touch upon the great need of restoring relationship with God. That is, they're actually longing for somewhere to live in that ideal relationship with God like Adam and Eve did in Eden. They want to get back to real relationship with God. Um, and there's only one place they're ever going to get it, which is heaven. So the New Testament author sees uh, the promised land as only a shadow of what God really promised Abraham. Yep, a promised land, a geography, but always a greater promise on view, eternal life, heaven, the very thing Jesus brings as he comes as our saviour. So how does this help us apply Joshua to ourselves? If we've got that bridge that we can cross from Old Testament to New Testament or Old Covenant to New Covenant where we live, um, we might simply ask the question, well, as Joshua looked at his future and what remained to be done, what is it as we look to our future, what remains to be done? What promises are we waiting to see fulfilled? And I hope you can see that's actually, um, once you've got there, once you've crossed that bridge, it starts to, to be a bit clearer what Joshua says to us because we're people waiting for promises to be fulfilled too, aren't we? Um, we have been promised heaven, eternity, a place in God's kingdom. We've been purchased at a great price through the blood of Jesus and yet we're not there yet. We're still longing for the future that we've been promised. We're still longing for in our inheritance too. And so what are we called to do from Joshua? Well, just as Joshua and Israel are called to get on with it and complete the task, so too God has given us a really clear task as his people. Um, our mission is to see the nations come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour and Lord. And so we speak of mission and evangelism often, uh, but the reality is the challenge of Joshua to us is to press on in making Christ known to build his kingdom and to rely on God in doing the work. Uh, I think there's some really great encouragement in this chapter of Joshua for us because, of course, Joshua is 85 and he doesn't feel up to the task. Um, so if you're getting a little advanced in years... And you might think, I'm not sure if I'm up to the task of seeing that the world won for Christ. A gentle rebuke in the passage today for you, it's the Lord's work. So actually, keep praying, keep sharing Jesus because he has promised he will build his kingdom. And if you're a bit reluctant in getting on with this task of sharing Christ with others, um, regardless of your age, just recognise that actually that is a, an inappropriate thing to act upon because it is God's work. And so our own inherent reluctance to share Christ with others, it's actually inappropriate. God is building his kingdom and we're called to get on with the work. Uh, Joshua and the Israelites were going to have to fight to carry through on this task, which I think is a terrible reality for them. 
Um, but don't forget, the New Testament also says that we are involved in a battle. As we seek to make Christ known, we're engaged in the spiritual battle, not against flesh and blood, but against uh, the, what, what Paul terms the authorities of this dark world, uh, which is really another way of talking about Satan and those who oppose the good news of the gospel. And so, brothers and sisters, don't diminish the challenge of making Christ known. This world does not want us to make Christ known and neither does Satan. So you will find it a struggle, but step forward faithfully in sharing the good news of Jesus because it is God's work and he will undertake it and he will fulfil it. Well, I'd like to, to spend a little bit more time uh, talking about fulfilment and failure. Um, and if you read through the whole book of Joshua, that'd be great. But if you read through chapters 13 to 17, at a minimum this week, um, you'll notice that there's a very significant theme that emerges in these chapters, which is quite important to notice. So Israel do press on. They do take the land and it is allotted to them. And we're taken steadily through the allotments to Israel by Joshua. And most of it's very, very successful as they get more and more of the land and steadily uh, settle in. But just notice that there's a steady, small drumbeat of human failure in the picture. It's a picture of God's fulfilment, but of Israel's failure. And I'll just read one of these moments that uh, points this failure out. And you might look for the rest of these little moments as you read through these chapters yourself. But we read in chapter eight, uh, sorry, chapters 13, verse 8 to 13, about the previous generation uh, that had settled into the west bank of uh, the Jordan under Moses' leadership. We're reminded in chapter 13, verse 8, Moses had defeated them and taken over their land, but the Israelites didn't drive out the people of Jeshur and Maaka. So they continued to live among the Israelites to this very day, verse 12 to 13. Credit is given to Moses for his victory in those early campaigns, but responsibility for failure is laid at the feet of Israel, the nation, for their neglect to complete the work thoroughly, despite God's uh, guarantee that he would drive the peoples out before them. And as I said, this forms a bit of a drumbeat down through the chapters. As we read about their conquests, we also continually read about their failure to remove the people that were living there before. And if you know the, the story of the Old Testament, you might see just what a fundamentally important moment this is as Israel just begin as a nation in the Promised Land. It's a picture of compromise. And that compromise blossoms into a picture of failure across the Old Testament, which eventually leads to Israel's judgment as they follow the, the other gods of these people who they allow to remain in the land. God is faithful and Israel fail. And so a final challenge for us as we consider the, the task that we've been given to be people who make Jesus known in God's world I wonder, do you hear the challenge of Joshua today? We're called to be people who trust that God will help us and carry through on his mission. Do you settle for compromise? Uh, I hope you know the answer to that question. Uh, the answer is twofold. We are compromised people, aren't we? So we regularly confess our sins together as a congregation because we acknowledge we do sin, we, we fail. So what should we do? Well, praise God, he has cleaned our slate through the saving blood of Jesus. He sees us as if we haven't failed. Astonishing. But also, praise God, that he has given us his spirit who is now active in his world and who has uh, lordship over the hearts and minds of those we share with. Uh, encouragement. Yes, we may be compromised, but yes, we are effective in mission because our God is at work. So, brothers and sisters, look ahead to what remains. Uh, the future kingdom 
and your neighbours and friends and family members who must know Jesus. Let's pray uh, that he would enable us to be faithful. Loving Father, we thank and praise you for who you are, the God of love and of holiness. And we thank you that you've loved this world so much that despite our sin, you've given your son. Father, we ask as we read Joshua that you would remind us that this kindness isn't what we deserve, uh, but that you have shown us your mercy. And Lord, help us to know, uh, to now look ahead to what remains for us to do as your church, to make disciples and to, to uh, share gladly the good news we've received, not to make excuses, not to compromise in sharing the truth, but to trust that you will bring men and women and children to know you. Give us the confidence of Caleb and Joshua in doing what you've called us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Tom, for that reminder to uh, share our faith and uh, not to be ashamed of the hope that we have. There's a lot of talk about inheritance. Peter writes uh, a little bit there in um, <clears throat> 1 Peter 2 verse 9 is but you, um, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light so there is that sense in in inheritance that we're a bit like the Levites that we get uh, God himself as his as his inheritance so with that in mind let's um, stand and sing Christ is mine forevermore
Please be seated. We're going to have a short confession before we pray. Uh, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What amazing words they are. So let's read together um, the uh, confession on the screen, but only if you agree with the words because we are saying these things. So, you know, if you don't say things if you don't agree with them. Uh, hopefully, yes. Okay. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's great to pray the Lord's Prayer. It certainly covers all the bases. But Jesus gave us this in answer to the request, teach us how to pray rather than not teach us what we should pray. So I'm going to, we're going to use each point, each line of the Lord's Prayer as, as like a little topic heading. So we'll read it. I'll say a bit and then we'll have a brief pause and you can pray those things yourself. And um, uh, uh, if, you have, if something comes to mind that you really want to pray out loud, then who am I to stop you? Okay. So, um, yeah. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So, we can come to you as our Father, not my Father or his Father or her Father, knowing that your plans are good for all your people and that they ultimately give glory to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Hallowed be your name. We ask that your people will speak boldly of your love and goodness. Thank you for those in ministry who devote themselves to uh, learning the deep things of you and teaching your word to other people. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. We think of this, um, uh, the words of uh, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, through who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We thank you that, that, uh, that Jesus is bringing God's kingdom, your kingdom here. Give us today our daily bread. Father, we are helpless to sustain ourselves. Like little babies, we rely on you for food, shelter, comfort, stimulation, and love. We see and too often we follow the world's way of trusting in ourselves for security and looking down on those who are struggling. We also want to pray, I'll grab the notice. Okay, uh, if, uh, Donald Robinson Village, they have um, the following prayer points that they um, to give thanks to God for the lessons they're learning through the book of Joshua and to pray for wisdom for John and Faye to be able to reduce their work commitments in line with each of them working one day less a week. And our general points for St John's, uh, we give thanks uh, for the, uh, the, the marriage of Dan Weed and, and Joyce in Queensland. And as we uh, gear up for the federal election, we also pray that the campaigners will show integrity and a desire to serve. We pray, God, that you'll work with all people um, through all people in public office. Amen. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Thank you, God, for reminding us that we do not have the luxury of being proud or unforgiving since we ourselves continue to sin against you. And Jesus underlined that message at the end of, um, of the Lord's Prayer in the Gospels. 
So help us to, to just have that right view of ourselves before you that, um, that no matter what other people do to us, that we recognise that, um, uh, that vengeance is yours, that you repay and that, um, that we... Uh, and, and just grant us that ability to forgive as, as you've forgiven us. Lead us not into temp temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. Father, you teach us to, to run away from some things like you know, sexual immorality and um, other temptations, that it's not good for us to uh, uh, expose ourselves to, um, to things that, that could potentially hurt us. And, so we, we do ask that, um, that you would uh, uh, help us in this age of social media to, um, to shield our eyes from, um, and, and our hearts from things that, that are going to disturb us. Uh, we also remember that uh, Satan is, is there roaming about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Uh, thank you that greater is uh, he that is in us that is, than he that is in the world, that you've given us uh, your Holy Spirit who can... Uh, um, help us um, avoid and, and to repel um, Satan's plans, that we have the whole armour of God to protect us. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. Jesus brought the kingdom of God to earth when he became man and lived and died to pay for our sins. Jesus brought God's power when he rose from death. And when he ascended to heaven, he received glory and, um, and he's returning again to receive glory from those on earth. Now and forever. Amen. I do want, I, I struggle to know how to pray with you, uh, the, Ukraine, um, the, the war in Ukraine. It's, it's just so absolutely dreadful and uh, to, to talk about uh, God's plans and everything is, is very hard. And so we've got that prayer on the screen, Graham, that um, uh, our Archbishop Kanishka um, wrote this one. So I'm going to start with that. Sovereign Lord, you observe all those who dwell on earth. Have mercy, we pray, on those who now suffer the, the miseries of a war not of their own making. Have compassion on the wounded and dying. Comfort the brokenhearted. Confound the hatred and madness of those who make war. Guide our rulers, bring war to an end, bring peace across the world. Unite us all under the reign of your son, the Prince of Peace, before whose judgment seat the rulers of the world will give an account. And in whose name we pray, amen. Uh, sorry, I should have had my bookmark. Um, we're unfamiliar with uh, war but um, one who was very familiar with it was uh, uh, King David. And he has two questions, one of them why, but another question which is probably more relevant is how long? So Psalm 13, how long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O God, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him. My foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. And the start of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and I'm not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted you, sorry, they trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Okay, amen. Uh, Tom, you, have you got some notices for us? Thanks.
Well, today, uh, brothers and sisters, we have a delightful opportunity to spend a bit more time together uh, over lunch. So we've got soup being served in the hall immediately following uh, the service, which has just been a great joy over the last uh, few weeks to start doing lunch together again. And I hope you're able to stay today. The, the reason, of course, is simply to do something remarkable, which we haven't been able to do for the past two years, and enjoy each other's company, catch up, find out how we can be praying for each other and have some of these um, deeper conversations, uh, particularly uh, the troubles that we see in our world at the moment. They are alarming and it is good to be able to talk and pray together about them. So please do uh, stay on for lunch and uh, enjoy soup and a bread roll, which I've been told is um, uh, simply, you know, make a donation as you come to lunch and um, that would be a wonderful way of encouraging uh, those lunch times together. Uh, also, I did want to let you know that there's lots coming up in the bulletin just by way of some of the related uh, ministries that we as a church partner in. So you can see that uh, the Sutherland Board for Christian Education, they're having a fundraising evening on Wednesday the 11th of May held down the road at uh, Seoul Revival Church. A great ministry of high school SRE to be encouraging and supporting so I do that, commend that to you and uh, Mother's Union have their meeting coming up on the 10th of May here at church at 10.30am and uh, you're welcome to join them and bring your own lunch uh, and share in that time of fellowship afterwards and uh, of course a reminder to you a couple of online uh, opportunities commanding the heart uh, dealing with the issue of lust, being run by Moore College, which I'd recommend coming up on the 4th of May, and being a body, single-minded, are running a, a great uh, live stream on 30th of July. And, of course, you can read through the whole book of Joshua at 3pm this afternoon. I can see the stampede um, happening now. Uh, so please do keep in prayer those points in your bulletin. And uh, I think... The uh, only other thing that I wanted to say this morning, which isn't in the bulletin, is just to encourage you uh, from uh, the Easter weekend. We spent the few weeks before Easter thinking about those we could invite to church and praying for them and then inviting them. And it was a delight to see so many people who were newcomers to church over Easter. I wanted to say, well done. Um, if you were like me and you invited a friend and they said, no, thank you, don't give up. I thought, who says no thank you to the senior minister? Come on. Um, but they did. And don't be discouraged because our, um, our kind of research indicates that people generally say yes on your 10th invitation. So keep praying, keep inviting uh, gently and uh, just, you know, just keep loving your friends. Don't, don't give up uh, because we've seen that God is the one who is in control of hearts today and who has called us to be faithful in mission. So... Uh, uh, keep going uh, and be encouraged. I thought Easter was a great time. Reese, back to you. Thank you. Our God is beautiful, wonderful and powerful. Let's stand and sing, beautiful one.
The beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing. How marvelous, how wonderful you my heart with this love cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you you opened my eyes to your wonders and you you captured my heart with this love cause nothing on earth is as beautiful And stay standing if you like. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And enjoy lunch.